haven't heard me, but now. Just say testing. Testing. Okay. All right, cool. Ooh. I did my senior thesis on the question of do video games cause violence. Uh, the debate of whether or not video games cause violent has, violence has been around since the, since the 1990s. Video games do not create violent behavior. The, vi the, violent, be the violent tendencies have to already be within that person uh, from either past trauma or experiences. Uh, the number of factors to take in consideration when discussing this topic uh, such as a person's childhood or whether or not uh, uh, there, is a, there is a history of abuse or some type of trauma. Violence came to come from, come from many different uh, places, one of those places being abuse from parents or, and uh, uh, childhood trauma from those parents. Uh, children that come from families with a history of substance, pro substance abuse problems or problems uh, with, with parents abusing their children uh, and other family members uh, sometimes grow up to have uh, uh, mental health problems that uh, could, be, could make them prone to violent behavior. As a uh, prone to violent, be violent behavior and uh, violent out outbursts uh, as, as a response to seeing violent content in a video game. Uh, so far, those uh, so for those individuals that play video games like Call of Duty, or Call of Duty Black Ops, or Modern Warfare, um, video game scenes uh, of characters being beaten or tortured can uh, trigger some of those, uh, some of that trauma, and trigger them to lash out. Uh, but for most people, seeing those scenes don't doesn't doesn't trigger anything more than a slight feeling of uh, discomfort. Why do games get blamed? Uh, games are blamed uh, for being uh, too are blamed for being too violent, uh, very often by people uh, that have children, uh, and when they see those children uh, seeing these violent acts in, in a video game, uh, they might think uh, it is normal and, and an acceptable action to do um, themselves. When parents see their kids witnessing these violent acts uh, in games like Mortal Kombat and Call of Duty and are worried that the child might be corrupted uh, in a way. Uh, parents seeing their kids witnessing these, uh, violent, these violent actions uh, can, uh, are led to the assumption that, they're, that the, the companies are, making their child, are deliberately making their children violent, which is not the case. Um, Video games are also blamed by political figures. Uh, they uh, they blame them because they blame them because violent video games are an easy way uh, to explain a motive behind uh, shootings and other crimes. Uh, former President Donald Trump, in regards to the shootings in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, says this: uh, "We must we must stop the glorification of." Uh, violence in our society. Uh, this includes gruesome and grisly video games uh, that have now become commonplace. It is too easy, uh, too easy today for those troubled youth uh, to surround themselves with a culture that celebrates violence. We must stop or substantially reduce, the, uh, reduce this, and it, and it has to begin immediately. Political figures often blame video games because it is good press for them and makes them and it paints them in a light as if they're the good person and that they want to save the children. Uh, but, there's a mul but there's multitudes of research that prove video games do not cause violence and in fact have many benefits. Gaming has proven health benefits. Say what?
But we only talk about the negatives. Here are some surprising benefits of being a gamer in reasonable doses. Playing shooters can improve a person's ability to think about objects in three dimensions, just as well as academic classes designed to improve the same skill. Gaming actually develops the physical brain. There's increased white and gray matter integrity in both the visual and motor pathways, thereby improving reaction time and coordination. The Columbia School of Public Health found gaming actually improved peer relationships and supported healthy social skills. Those who reported playing strategy games such as RPGs had improvements in problem solving and academic performance the following year. Simple accessible games that can be played quickly can improve players' moods, promote relaxation, and even ward off anxiety. Video games aren't going anywhere. And they certainly have downsides, especially if you overdo it. So instead of villainizing, let's keep investigating how to make them work for us. Video games have been proven to help uh, improve hand-eye coordination and in some cases uh, strengthen and grow new friendships and relationships uh, with new people. Certain video games uh, can provide a boost of dopamine and serotonin. Uh, for instance, after a long day of school, most teenagers uh, will unwind and relax by playing some Call of Duty with their friends uh, or, or by playing another game such as Doom. Uh, well, games like Call of Duty or um, or some other f violent first-person shooter, uh, you can get uh, angry by dying or losing a match, but it's not enough rage and anger to uh, commit a serious crime. A study conducted uh, at Ninyang Techn Technological University in Singapore uh, says that sitting down and playing certain video games uh, could help enhance the ability to think uh, on one's feet. They can. Uh, they found. They found that. Uh, a physical-based complex puzzle game, like uh, a call, game called Cut the Rope, was beneficial at improving uh, ex executive brain functions. Uh, executive brain functions uh, is the term that implicates management of, cogn of cognitive tasks such as memory, uh, decision making, and planning and problem solving. Uh, other games, such as Candy Crush uh, 2048. Uh, are also uh, in the same category as cut the rope, uh, in that they make your brain ge your brain's gears turn and uh, to find a solution. Games like Nitro Type can also help increase uh, people's ability in the, how many words they can type per minute, uh, thereby expanding the brain. As you can tell, I enjoy video games quite a bit. Uh, I actually want to become a game, video game designer. Uh, they work on developing game characters, their backstories, um, their traits, game plots, settings, uh, game rules. Candidates uh, can also uh, create obstacles within the game, such as puzzles, uh, and advise other professionals to uh, involved in the game's design on ways to improve the quality. Uh, according to Payscale, uh, game designers generally make about $40,000 to $112,000 a year. Uh, the requirements for a position, I need a associate's degree or vocational school program certificate uh, with software design or computer graphics. I got the opportunity to interview uh, Becca who runs her own game studio and has made, has made games uh, like Overland and Night in the Woods. Um, so especially when you're in college, I recommend that you participate in like all sorts of side projects um, because those side projects will also be on your resume eventually. So there's things called game jams where you like, which I don't love because it like encourages crunch culture and whatever, but um, you can like just make a game with like five people over two to four days. And then you can sort of like identify the cool things that went well with it and also like the problems with it. And you're only spending two to four days on it. So it's okay to like throw it away um, yeah. or, and critique it and can like put it up on your website and sort of talk about it intelligently. Um, because if you're going to design, it means you have to design lots of things all the time. Because um, you're going to fail spectacularly on the regs. Um, not all your designs are going to pan out. Um, as soon as you implement it, it's just going to be garbage. Call it hot garbage. <laughs> like, uh, even the game we're building internally, uh, 
we've added so much like stuff to it. It's like we had to just had to put it through what we call a haircut, which is like all this stuff is cool, but none of it works together properly and it needs to be trimmed down and we need to like sort of bend and refocus around these pieces that are working really well. Um, and it doesn't matter how good your game design document is, that's just what happens is you sort of like it gets real big and then you trim it back and it gets real big and you don't understand how to trim things back unless you have made lots of things to identify whether it's good or not. Um, so make things, make bad things, make broken things, make great things, just make things. Um, that's how you just get better at design. Um, what, uh, what's like the time frame for like a game to be made? <laughs> An eternity. <laughs> I take forever. Uh, some games, I know I have a, like friends who are able to launch like kind of a game a year. Um, none of these are like coming to your console anytime soon. Um, and they also have more lo-fi artwork, um, simpler like systems design. Um, anytime you get into I, kind of any game that my studio makes, I, we're looking at like, I mean, two to seven years. Um, like, uh, Chicory was, what year was that? 2019 to 2021, so two years, two and a half years start to finish. Um, at least start to first launch, because um, we've been updating and fixing things, because once you launch a game, it's just not done. Um, you just have to f fix it and clean it up forever. Um, so yeah, that was two and a half years start to finish, um, whereas Tunic, I mean, Tunic's going on like seven years probably at this point. Um, Overland was seven years, whereas Wilmot's Warehouse was like two or two and a half. Um, but then if I go back to like Cannabalt, um, Cannabalt took a week to make, and then we ported it to iOS within three weeks. Um, so um, yeah, it was maybe four and a half weeks start to finish on Cannibal, and then we've had to support it for the last, I mean, what, 11 years or 12 years, however long it's been out. Uh, so, so yeah, um, it kind of depends. Like, and you probably come across like AAA studios, um, yeah. where uh, what was it? I think Red Dead Redemption was like seven years in the making, yeah. Um, whereas, like, they can do a like sports game because it's built on past tech in a way faster time because they're just like updating yeah. art, updating players, updating all of that, and yeah. maybe adding a feature or two. Um, and they're able to like churn those a lot faster. But yeah. even then, they're churning them with like a studio of like 300 people. Yeah. Uh, Marvel for 2019 was in develop for development for five years and it is a very polished game and looks amazing. Uh, she mentioned a thing called crunch culture, which in and of itself is a whole problem in the game community. Um, Cyberpunk 2077 was a game that was heavily affected by crunch culture, uh, with deadlines being pushed and employees uh, having to work on paid hours, uh, which resulted in an unfinished game that was full of bugs and glitches. My four-year plan is to graduate, move to Seattle, and roll in uh, the game design and production program at AIE, uh, which is the... Academy of Interactive Entertainment. Uh, I get a little job with a roommate, pay rent, uh, graduate with an advanced diploma in video game design and production. Um, my uh, four year plan also includes after graduating, getting a little job as a game tester and working my way up to a game designer. Those are my sources. Um, 
Um, I'm not too sure yet. I might. I want to work on like kind of big games, but I also want to like maybe work for like a small like indie studio. What's your favorite video game to play? Oh, you're not. Can you not say it out loud? No. I don't really have like a favorite video game. Doom Eternal is pretty fun. Um, I'd like to work on that kind of game, like work for Bethesda. Um, Valorant's also pretty fun. So. How many hours a day do you spend playing video games? Here's the real question. Recently, probably only like two, but I mean, I got, I've have, I've like spent probably six hours playing a game. So, but I just, that was just because I lost track of time, I guess. Right. And I had nothing so else to do. Summer when you have more time. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay, we will be back at 2.30 with Gunner. See you then. Okay. Although most people do not know it, music is actually one of the most benef beneficial influences on our minds. It can be therapeutic, it can help with learning, and it's fun to learn and listen to. Music can be confusing at times, but it still makes us happier even if most people do not know it. <sighs> music has the power to boost mood, boost IQ in infants. Um, Mozart and other classical music is often played for babies. Babies play classical music are shown to have higher IQs, but only by three or four points. Um, music is such a big part of our lives that most people can't imagine life without it. It has been shown to boost mood, reduce anxiety, and even slow the effects of dementia. The Mozart effect is the idea that Mozart makes people s smarter. This has been prov proven s false among adults, but it does make babies smarter. It helps some adults and teens study, but only if they enjoy classical Mozart-type music. 
Can you study to any music? The short answer is yes. Most people can study with any music, but to study effectively, you need music that isn't distracting. So slow, calm music with no lyrics. My favorite music to study to is anything instrumental like classical music or lo-fi. Every human being has a perception of music and our brains will automatically process any musical patterns or tones. Um, he or she is, sh he is showing a video that the whole crowd has a perception of music. By giving them three examples of high and low tones and then having them distinguish the tones by himself, he basically composed his own orchestra. Um, auditory systems in our brains recognize music and that is different from regular speech. Our brain also hears auditory phenomenons like bat, bass, and treble and realizes it's music and releases dopamine. The brain won't release dopamine unless you like music the music that you're listening to. One in ten people are tone deaf. Tone deafness can go away with musical therapy or any musical training. Anyone that isn't tone deaf can become a great musician. A tone deaf person cannot recognize differences in pitch. This means that they cannot sing along with even simple tunes and can't match the pitch of their voice to a piece of music that is being played. Most, most musicians make music to get their emotions out. Others try to relay a message through music. Music can control our emotions, so why not put emotion into it? Musicians show emotion with their faces, singing and dancing during live performances. Musical theory is the study of the many possibilities of music. Most musicians study it so that they can make their own scales in music. This is a randomly generated scale that is said to be a perfect scale. Um, most professional performers, musicians, and athletes use very fast-paced and sometimes angry music to hype themselves up before games or events. Most athletes will wear headphones to zone out to music while they warm up or to just zone out and get focused to get game to before games. UCLA did a 2016 study to see how well their athletes performed in scrimmage games after getting hype up music, and the athletes who got hype up music performed much better than the ones who did not. I interviewed Dan McKenzie for my interview. Um, I asked him about careers in the music industry and he said, there are no viable careers in the music anymore because of how much music changes. A rock band that was popular in the 90s isn't really gonna be popular anymore. 
It changes a lot, so you're going to have to adapt if you want a job in the music industry. I also asked him how music is related to the brain and how humans think and operate. And he said, most people will grow up loving music, but everyone has a different genre or band. For me, it was the Beatles. For you, 90s grunge and Metallica. I just think it's crazy how diverse some people's views on music are. Music was, a, was very big for people during COVID. A lot of people picked up an instrument. I picked up the guitar right before we went to a lockdown. Multiple news channels like CNN, NBC, and CBS did surveys to see how many people started learning a new instrument and how many people started listening to music more. The results were 45% of the people start a new instrument, 63% of people listen to more music, and 2% said nothing changed. Musicians also did um, online performances to raise money for the COVID vaccine. <sighs> Musical therapy is a therapy used to occupy someone by learning or listening to music. It helps special needs patients, PTSD patients, and others. By occupying someone, it gets their mind off their stress and just occupies their brain. It can also heal the brain and bring back some lost memories by playing the music from one's past and they will remember events from that song. The career I chose was a musical or recreational therapist. Um, requirements is a bachelor degree. Um, salary is 40000 to 100000 a year, $22.50 per hour on average. Um, the typical day is either helping patients study, study or, wait, whoa. A typical day is either helping your patients or studying your patients to figure out things you can do to help them. Um, the main goal is to help people with mental disabilities or mental blocks get better than they would without. Um, my four-year plan is two years of any vocational program at Dallas College. At, whoa. Sorry, I messed that up. My four-year plan is two years at a vocational program at Rio Hondo Dallas Co College or Tarrant County College, which is also in Dallas. And if I like it, I will transfer to a four-year if I want to continue school. Uh, if not, I'll find a job in the field I, I had studied in. We're excited. I was like, I was listening to music one day and I was like feeling pretty down and I just turned on a song that like I liked and I just got happier and I was just wondering like why. And it was during the time when we were picking like our topics so that's what I chose. What was the song? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I, my, I, my favorite song changes like every other week so I don't know. Uh, assassin. <laughs> the person that you interviewed said there weren't any viable jobs in the music industry, but I was wondering if you talked about peripheral to actually being a musician, like being, yeah. working in sound, mm -hmm. because then if the music changed, the, the person in the industry who's supporting them would still have work. Yeah, he he meant more like 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 job stability, because you could be like a producer, but then like. The music, you have to like learn you have to adapt really quickly okay. so sometimes if you're not like an adaptable person it's not a very viable option for a job what's your favorite song this week <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know um, I, I I really don't know that, I just listen to music and I'm just like this song's pretty cool and I go on with my day Anyone else? Does anybody have a last, uh, last question? Well, can you um, tell us that you, you had a little bit, you wrote more um, in your research paper than you talked about here, about mm -hmm. giving students here some advice about getting ready for finals and what they should do, what would be ideal music oh, yeah, for yeah. lack of music since we're right at a point where we're going to be doing a lot of study. So when like students that were played music in like a study were had higher test scores than students who weren't. 
and those students were played a song called Blur. It's an older song. It was really popular for a bit. It, this was like in the 90s, the study. Um, they had a, like a much higher test score than the ones who weren't played it. And yeah, but any music, the, the study has shown that literally any music just helps you. Like you, just listening to music before your final or test will help you get a higher score just because you, your brain and you feel more confident. So they're probably supposed to listen before the test? Mm -hmm. as opposed to during yeah. Or while you're studying. Okay. studying, studying, it's probably better. It, it depends. If you're in a quiet room, just don't listen to any music. But if there's people around you, listen to music. Preferably instrumental music because you can actually get the information you're studying into your brain rather than focusing on the lyrics of the song. All right. Well, thank you. We will be back online in 10 minutes for Beverly's presentation. We'll see you then. <coughs>
Ricky Gervais and Bill Maher went after her. So that. Um, another reason why animals become extinct is because of natural uh, disasters. Natural disasters can include tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, um, earthquakes, and any animal is has the possibility of becoming extinct because of the natural disaster. So it's not just one type of animal that can go extinct. Any animal has the possibility of going extinct. Um, private landowners do play a big and important role because half of the endangered species live on private property. So the wildlife belongs to the public even though it's on private property. So the endangered species, um, even though they're on private property, they depend on the private property um, habitat. So private landowners have to come up with conservation plans to, in order to make sure that the animals are being uh, properly uh, protected on the private property. Sometimes private property landowners don't want to deal with the um, legal system and the Endangered Species Act, so they'll secretly kill the animals that are living on the private land. For example, um, people would knock over bird nests, like uh, bald eagle bird nests, so they don't have to deal with the Endangered Species Act and the legal system. And then the uh, other options for private landowners are land exchanges if they don't want to deal with the uh, legal system. The Endangered Species Act was signed in 1973 by President Nixon, and its goal was to identify endangered species and stop the decline, and also to uh, come up with reco recovery plans so that the um, population can increase. There are four different levels in the Endangered Species Act, the first one being vulnerable. That's when the population is at, um, it's decreasing, but not at a rate where they need to worry about it as much. And then endangered is when they start, they need to start working on recovery plans so that the population doesn't decrease. And then critically endangered is when the population is like very low and it's about to become an extinct. And then extinction is the last one when there's no more animals of the species left. Someday, if you are in the right place and if you are lucky, you will look up and see an eagle on the wing. It's a sight to stop your heart. The very first broadcast of Sunday morning featured this report from Cobbs Cook Bay, Maine, where bald eagles were on the brink of extinction. The national bird is an endangered species. Forty years later, the eagle population has soared thanks to protections put in place by the Endangered Species Act. With your support and with the help of the Congress, we can reclaim and preserve the natural beauty of America. In the decades since President Richard Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act, the landmark law has grown to cover more than 2,400 species. The good news is that 99% of them have not been declared extinct. The not so good news is that only 2% have recovered, like the bald eagle and the American alligator. Recovery takes time, a lot of time. Check out this down there. Yep. The five animals that I focused on was a brown bear, otherwise known as a grizzly bear, and we don't have grizzly bears here, we have the black bears, the southern sea otter, the snow leopard, the bald eagle, and our local bighorn sheep. The first animal is the bald eagle. It was listed, enlisted into the endangered species list in 1967. Um, the main reason that the, the bald eagle went in what endangered was because of the widespread use of pesticide DDT after World War II, which caused them to lay uh, eggs with very thin shells, so the eggs would die before even hatching. Um, the bald eagle was protected by the endangered species list, and because the population was very low, it was also protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, which set, which set guidelines and for landowners and actions on private property. It gave them legal protections and it banned the use of DDT. Another part of the recovery plan was captive breeding programs. And just made uh, the captive breeding programs did health assessments on the bald eagles and made sure that they were good to go before they were out set out to the wild. They reintroduced populations into different areas so the population can go all throughout. The, the bald eagle did have a good recovery plan. In 1963, the population was 417. 
And in 2007, the population increased to 9,789. The brown bear is the second animal that I focused on. It was enlisted in 1975. Um, the main reason it went endangered was because of human actions. Uh, humans would hunt for the bears to sell their fur and body parts. Another reason it went endangered was because people would drive too fast and not pay attention and they would run over the bears, causing them to die. Um, another reason was because bears' food supply was also decreasing, so they didn't get enough food, so they would uh, starve to death. And then people thought that bears were unlimited, like the amount of bears were unlimited, so they didn't conserve them. And then um, they also didn't like the bears. They thought they were evil and they didn't have any value of living. So for the recovery plan, people had to come up with plans and ideas to protect the bears. Um, it re included planting new fruit trees so that they had a new supply of food. The bears did have a good recovery and they are now delisted from the endangered species list. The next animal that I focused on was the southern sea otter. It was enlisted in 1977, and some of the reasons why it became endangered was because people would hunt them to sell their fur, oil spills, they would get caught in fishing gear, and they would also get diseases. Um, the, wide, the wide world population before 1741 was 150,000 to 300,000. But after the commercial hunt began, the numbers decreased to 1,000 to 2,000. Um, at one point, people thought that the Southern Sea Otter went fully extinct until they found a group of 32 in Big Sur. So after they found the group of 32, they started to protect them and the population started to increase. When they reappeared, the state started to impose restrictions with girls in trammel net fishing. And after they set those restrictions, the population grew to 24,000, and California legally protected them. With the population being so vulnerable to oil spills, they started to impose taxes on oil that was being transferred or, or processed. They would also set new colonies into, of the sea otters into their own zones, but then after a while, they found out that it was nearly impossible to have the sea otters in their own zones, so they let set them out free. But for unknown reasons, the population was still decreasing, but their um, recovery is better than other endangered species. The next animal I focused on was the, the snow leopard. It was enlisted in 1972. Some of the reasons why it became endangered was because people would illegally hunt them for, um, to sell their fur and body parts, and they also did have a decrease in natural prey. Farmers and herders were very against the snow leopards because they found them a threat to their own farm animals. So whenever they came to their, near their farm, they would kill the snow leopards. The recovery plan encouraged better enforcement of protective measures for them. They offered rural peeper, people other um, options of income so that they didn't have to kill the animals to get income from selling their fur or body parts. The snow leopards are no longer endangered. In 2020, the population was 4,000 to 6,500. Um, one of the local animals that I focused on was the bighorn sheep. In 1995, there were only 100 of them left in this year in Nevadas. Um, the main reason that they became endangered was because they would come in contact with domestic sheep, which would cause them to get diseases. There are three components when monitoring the sheep. The first one being um, managing genetics, meaning that they had to make sure that the sheep in their own families didn't breed with each other because then they would get sick and die as well. So they had to like relocate the animals and make sure to put them in new um, areas, which is also called heterozygosity. The second one is monitoring them with collars, which I'll talk about in another slide when I have my interview with Sarah. And then the last one is just educating people on why they became endangered and ways that are helping them to get their population increasing. Um, part of the recovery plan also included re uh, reintroducing them into new areas so the population can go all throughout the Sierra Nevada. Now there are more than 500 sheep.
um, by tracking them. So, and the way that we do that is that we capture them um, using a helicopter and then um, we um, bring them over to like a capture site and um, with the helicopter and then there on the ground, we fit a collar to them um, and we don't anesthetize them at all. They're like fully awake during this whole time. We do some health assessments, we check their body condition, um, take some blood samples, um, hair samples, look for ectoparasites, things like that. Um, and then once the animal has gone through that, what we call the processing, then the helicopter takes it back to where um, it had picked it up in the first place and releases it. And um, that whole scenario, you know, that, that can take. And then what she just talked about was a second component, component in monitoring the sheep just with the collars. Um, it is clear that the Endangered Species Act is helping animals and protecting them, but it's unclear how much it's helping them. It just depends if the animal is adjusting well to their own recovery plan, and if not, they have to come up with new ways that the animal can adjust well so that their population can increase. Um, a good recovery plan is simple, but it's hard to achieve. The people working with the Endangered Species Act has to have a good understanding of the animal and would um, in their interest of actually protecting their, the animals. The Fish and Wildlife Service also works with the Endangered Species Act to protect the animals. They identify ecosystems and organisms facing the greatest threats. They determine steps to reduce and eliminate the threats that the endangered species are having. The ultimate objective to the Endangered Species Act is to get the animals delisted and a good um, get them a good recovery plan so that their um, population can increase. Because I'm so interested in animals, I want to continue to be a vet. Um, vets examine animals, perform surgeries, um, treats and dresses wounds. To be a vet, it takes four years of college and then another four years in a vet program. I would either want to work in a vet clinic or travel to go to farms and work with bigger farm animals. The job outlook is 17%, which is faster than usual, and the salary is 99250 And then my four-year plan is to either to go to one of these colleges and study animal science. And there's my work cited. <laughs> It just depends, like, they, like, tell from the, all the animals that become, like, endangered, like, they get to a really low, like, number. Like, when they're critically endangered, that's when they're, like, really low and they're, like, about to be extinct. But then, like, when they're endangered, it's, like, kind of a higher, but they're still, like, compared to what they were before, it's really low. So that's when they need to start making recovery plans so they can get back to the population that they were, or even higher. Um, I was just really interested in animals and when coming up with um, ideas for the presentation, I ran across the Endangered Species Act, which I really, I didn't know like anything about and I was like, oh, like there are endangered species and I like was wondering like how like they're protected and how like their population increases and decreases and all the things that affect their population numbers. Valerie? Do you know how many animals are currently being protected by the endangered, or like an estimate, how many are being protected by the endangered? Um, I think like 2,000 or 3,000, but I may be wrong. I think that's what I saw in the video. Um, you know how recently we've had wolves coming back to California? Did you read anything about 
about whether uh, brown bears would come back to California at some point? Um, I didn't read anything about that, but um, let's hope. <laughs> Any more questions? We're good? Okay, I'm out. All right. Well, All right, thank you everyone. We'll be back tomorrow with Jessica a little earlier in the day. Jessica's at 11.40 tomorrow.